remember the brainstem is actually three regions of the brain, right? So it includes the midbrain, or you can say mesencephalon, the pons, and the medulla. So we'll just keep kind of going down the brainstem, like kind of working our way down. We'll start with the midbrain. Okay, so this is a diagram that's in your text that shows um, an anterior view and then kind of this posterior lateral view of the brainstem. But notice that what they did is they included the diencephalon on top of it, okay? So just so you are kind of oriented here, this is the thalamus. And you guys remember the thalamus is actually on top of the brainstem, right? It's up in the diencephalon. So this is the thalamus. This little thing here is the infundibulum. Remember we said this is the little piece of tissue that connects the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland, right? Just so you guys know, we haven't talked about cranial nerves yet. We'll talk about them later. But you can see a lot of the cranial nerves here. And you know, remember, they're attached to the brain and the brain stem, so they're kind of sticking out here. One of them that we see right here in this area is cranial nerve 2, also called the optic nerve. This carries visual images from the eye. And so you can see the two optic, optic nerves here. They would be coming back from the eye, and they're crossing over in this structure that's called the optic chiasm. This is on your study guide. So what the optic chiasm actually is, is it's in the midline. If these are our eyeballs here, the optic nerves come back. They actually cross over in the area of the diencephalon. And where they cross, that structure is called the optic chiasm. You can also say chiasma with an A, or you can just leave off the A, chiasm, okay? So here they are called optic nerves. And oops, I'm just going to abbreviate nerve. OK, optic nerves. This is the optic chiasm. After the optic chiasm, as they travel back toward the brain, they are referred to as the optic tracks. So here it has a different name. It's not called the optic nerve anymore. Now, we know that visual images are going to travel to what part of the cortex? It's easy because it's just called the primary visual area, right? Primary visual cortex. What lobe is that in? Occipital, Occipital right? It has to go way, way back there. But before this goes to the occipital lobe, what part of the brain would this would these visual images travel to? We talked about this last time. It's in the diencephalon. We said that one of the structures in the diencephalon receives all sensory input from the entire body except for smell. And it kind of sorts it out, and then it sends it to the cortex. What area is that? The thalamus, right? Yes, the sensory relay station. So the optic tracks will kind of stop at the thalamus, and then from there we have axons that will, you know, neurons that will take the information back to the primary visual cortex in the occipital lobe. Okay, so if this was a thalamus, and I know I'm not drawing it anatomically correct, but just to uh, talk about it. Okay, so from here, neurons go back to the primary visual area in the occipital lobes. And just so you know, if you guys talk about this eventually in another class sometime, we're not going to go into this much detail with all this, but these neurons here that go from the thalamus back to the primary visual area, these travel in what are called the optic radiations. So these, the names of the, you know, the, the parts of that pathway change, okay? Mm -hmm. So two things, those three round circles at the top, those are the eyes? Yes. So these would be the eyeballs. And then I forgot, does the thalamus have two parts? The thalamus has two lobes. Okay. Yeah. So I didn't really draw this very well. They should be kind of connected here. What is that little piece of tissue that connects the two lobes of the thalamus? It goes through the third ventricle. Remember the third ventricle would be in between them. What is that little piece of tissue called? You can say the intermediate mass or 
inter thalamic oh. adhesion. Yeah, interthalamic adhesion. Okay. So anyway, just wanted to throw that in. I kind of got a little sidetracked with that. But some of that was review for you guys. You need to know about the thalamus. And the optic chiasm, again, this is on your list. Okay? Any questions on this before we go on? Okay. So going back to this diagram, so again, this is actually the diencephalon up here. And remember another structure that's in the diencephalon is the pineal gland, which is what this little structure is right here. Remember, this is the gland that secretes melatonin. Okay, so this is all diencephalon. Okay, so while we're talking about this, let me show you guys something. We have these brainstem models, right? This brainstem actually goes with the big brain, okay? And this is a separate model. Okay, these look kind of alike, very, I mean, very similar if you look at the structures that they're showing. These also look like these pictures, but these are a little different, okay? So just so you know, when you look at these later, these have actually part of the cerebrum stuck on top, okay? So here you do not see this, but it looks similar. This actually is supposed to be the basal nuclei. Okay, so remember we talked about the basal nuclei last time? The basal nuclei are deep in the cerebral hemispheres. This is actually a little piece of the corpus callosum. Remember the corpus callosum would be those axons that cross over the midline, connecting the two sides. If you look closely at this later, you'll see what looks like little spaces here. Those are the lateral ventricles, and you can see the septum pellucidum between them, okay? So it's like a little kind of chunk of, you know, the deep part of the cerebrum stuck on top. On this model, this is the thalamus, okay? And that would be, that space would be the third ventricle. There is the pineal gland, okay? And it's actually the same with this one. This is the basal nuclei. <coughs> this is the thalamus. So if you turn this around, you can kind of see that. I think we're more used to looking at these mid-sagittal cuts, so you might recognize it better here. But this is the thalamus. If you look closely, you can see the intermediate mass here, pineal gland, okay? Um, and then, of course, the brain stem is below. So just so you kind of, you know, don't get confused with that, this is not exactly like this picture. One more thing that we talk about that you can see on this model, notice this little, it looks like a little whoop, mohawk <laughs> sticking up here. This is actually the axons that would radiate out toward the cortex. So what are these axons called in that area where they radiate out toward the cortex? Corona radiata. Corona radiata, yes. And you can also see that here. Actually, this shows a little bit more of it. So this is the corona radiata. If we could see these axons down inside here, which of course you can't on the model, but if you could follow them down inside between the nuclei, that would be the internal capsule. Okay, so you might be wondering, hmm, is she gonna ask us to identify the basal nuclei on this? No, I do not. Because although this is the basal nuclei, you can't see them clearly. So I would rather have you guys identify the basal nuclei on the frontal section Okay, where you can see them, and you should be able to identify each individual nucleus, okay? Okay, okay. so going back to this diagram, and we're talking about the midbrain first. So we said that the brain stem is these three regions. The midbrain is here, shown in this kind of greenish color, okay? You can see the anterior view here, kind of the posterior lateral view here. This is the pons, this big thing right here. And then below that is the medulla. The medulla is continuous with the spinal cord. So this would all be spinal cord. I got that a little too high. Kind of right from here. Okay, so that right there is where it starts. So this is the spinal cord. Okay, so talking about the midbrain. So let's talk about these little bulges that we see on the posterior side first. Notice there are four little bulges here. So you can call these the corpora quadrigemina, quad meaning four, right? What this really means is four bodies, four bodies. This is also called the tectal plate. 
You can use either name. I know this one seems like it's easier. It's easier to spell, maybe, but this name kind of tells you more about it, so it's up to you. You can use either name. This is the posterior midbrain, and there are four little bulges here. So we have the two superior folliculi. Superior bumps are called the superior colliculi, and then two inferior colliculi. Okay, so that's what makes up the corpora quadrigemina or tectal plate. So what the superior colliculi do, the neurons there are responsible for giving us visual reflexes. Okay, visual reflexes. So you all know, I think we all know basically what a reflex is, right? It's something that gives us a quicker reaction time. So do we ever have to respond to something in our visual field quickly? Yes, we do, right? And this can be life-saving. So this is a really important part of the brain that allows us to react really quickly to something that might be coming toward us, that we have to you know, maybe get out of the way, respond to, whatever it might be. Like when we're driving, for instance, happens a lot. Um, or maybe playing sports, you know, a ball is coming at your face. <laughs> Um, so, the, so what we just drew, when I drew the eyeballs, I shouldn't have erased all that, okay, and we had the optic tracts coming back to the thalamus, this is the thalamus, most of these axons, just so you know, most of these axons carrying visual images will go directly to the thalamus, and then from here the information does go back to our visual cortex, but some of these axons instead of going to the thalamus, will actually kind of bypass the thalamus and go to the superior colliculi. And they'll synapse there on motor neurons that will turn the head and turn the eyes so that we can respond quickly to you know, something that might be coming toward us. Okay. Animals that are um, both predators and you know animals that are often prey um, have a really well developed superior colliculus because they have to be able to you know find their food and also to you know protect themselves. Okay, so the inferior colliculi, the two inferior bulges, are very similar, but these allow us to respond to something that we hear then we might have to respond too quickly. So these are more for auditory reflexes. They work basically the same way. Some of the axons coming from the eighth cranial nerve that carries sound will go directly to the inferior colliculi and synapse on motor neurons that turn the head and turn the eyes so that we look toward a sound that we might have to you know, react to quickly. So this just gives us a quicker response time Rather than having the information go back to the visual or the auditory cortex, and then from there go to another cortex where we're thinking about it, and then from there to the primary motor where we you know, can activate the muscles, it would take a little bit longer. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We have one of these, too, or something similar for, some, like when, for touch, like when it's too hot. Yes. So that's a reflex. The question was, what about when we touch something that's hot? We definitely have what's called a withdrawal reflex where we respond very quickly. The information still travels to the cortex so that we're aware on a conscious level of what happened, but that response doesn't require our cerebral cortex. It's just, actually, it's we're sensory neurons. If you guys remember the very first day we talked about nervous tissue, we looked at that diagram that's in chapter 14, and I said that what this actually is showing is a reflex where it showed the sensory neuron coming into the spinal cord, synapsing on a little interneuron that then synapsed on a motor neuron, and that was, you know, the motor neurons were the ones that were activating the muscles that would withdraw the body part. So again, a reflex, whether it's, you know, protective like these are, or, you know, some of them actually help us to maintain balance. We have different types of reflexes. They all give us a quicker reaction time. It really depends on 
when you say mentally slow, it kind of depends on what their um, limitations are, like where is the area in the brain that's affected. If it has to do just with parts of the cerebral cortex, that actually would not, it wouldn't um, affect this reflex. So they would still have a quick reaction time. They might have a slower time to um, become aware of what happened. You know, they may not really understand what their reflex is about. They may not understand what they're seeing, but they still would, this is just working on a, a kind of lower center in the brain where we don't need the cortex to kind of have that rational thought process. Yeah. If this area was damaged though, then it would affect their reflex. They wouldn't be able to respond quickly. Any other questions on that? Okay, so let's take a look at other parts of the midbrain. So you can see this area here that's more on the anterior aspect. Notice that we see what looks like kind of um, almost like striations here. That's because this is actually the part of the midbrain that projection tracks travel through. So do you guys remember what projection tracks are? Remember we talked about the different types of tracks? A tract is just a group of axons traveling together in the CNS. So it makes sense that we have to have, obviously in the brain stem, we have to have axons traveling through this area, connecting the brain to the spinal cord, right? So all these parts of the brain stem will have projection tracks passing through. Remember projection means that the axons are traveling, which direction? You can see it here, right, vertically. And so again, it makes sense. We're gonna have a lot of projection tracks passing through all these parts of the brainstem, connecting the brain to the spinal cord. So this is just the area where projection tracks pass through the midbrain. It's on the anterior part of the midbrain and it is called the cerebral peduncle. Peduncle is a funny word, but this is actually just another name for a tract. It literally means little foot, but it's another name for a tract. So this is projection tracks traveling through the midbrain. And it's located on the anterior aspect of the midbrain. Okay. And that's about all you can see when you're looking at the outside of the midbrain, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a cross section through it so we can see a couple of other nuclei that are inside. Okay, so taking a look at a cross section, we're gonna talk about these two groups of nuclei now that you can see inside the midbrain. These are both important for motor coordination. So like uh, the basal nuclei, this is another part of the brain that will communicate with the primary motor cortex to help coordinate our skeletal muscle contraction. And this is what we just talked about. Okay, so taking a look at this cross section, this is a cut through the midbrain, goes like that. Okay, these are the superior colliculi that we just talked about. Here's our cerebral peduncles where the projection tracks travel through. So this is posterior, this would be on the anterior side. You guys know what this is, right? This is the cerebral aqueduct. We said this passes through the midbrain. What does the cerebral aqueduct connect? Connects two ventricles, which ones? Connects the third and the fourth, right. Connects the third and the fourth ventricles. Okay, so notice how we have these nuclei here that are shown in red. These actually do appear red because they are supposedly, um, they have a really good blood supply. And um, so they appear kind of reddish. Um, these nuclei actually help to coordinate muscle contraction primarily in the upper extremities. But just know that these are important for motor coordination. Okay, the red nuclei supposedly help to um, with flexion movements of the upper extremities, which is really important for motor, motor coordination. And then also notice there's this strip of neurons that look dark. This is called the substantia nigra, which means dark substance 
or black substance. Okay, substantia nigra. This is another area that's important for motor coordination. It works along with all of these other motor areas, including the cortex. And this is an area that you've probably all heard about before because you hear a lot about Parkinson's disease. This is the part of the brain that's involved with Parkinson's. These neurons secrete a neurotransmitter called dopamine, and I'm not gonna ask you about dopamine on the test, but you may have heard of dopamine because of Parkinson's. So when these neurons stop secreting a normal amount of dopamine in Parkinson's disease, that's what happens. It will result in all kinds of um, different you know, coordination problems with the muscles. People who have Parkinson's usually have a tremor. They don't, you know, uh, they have a difficult time initiating and then stopping their muscle contraction so it's kind of out of control. They, um, uh, you know, have a hard time controlling facial expressions. So I'm sure you've all seen people that have Parkinson's. Um, so you know that it, it affects muscle contraction, skeletal muscle contraction. So this is another important area for motor coordination. Okay, so that is the midbrain. Anything that we do not talk about, as we go through these different areas, you do not have to know about, okay? We will be talking a little bit about the reticular formation, but I'm not going to have you identify it here. So the structures that we talked about are the ones I want you to be able to identify, and this diagram will be on the test. So you should be able to identify the parts of the midbrain that we talked about here, and you should also know that this is a cross-section through the midbrain. Notice the shape of it. And the parts of the, you know, the brain stem have a different shape if you look at their cross-sections. Okay. Okay, so let's go down to the ponds. Just a couple of things I'd like you to know about the ponds, and you'll talk more about it when you take physiology. Okay, so as we said, projection tracks travel through the entire brain stem, and one of the projection tracks traveling through the ponds is called the middle cerebellar peduncle. So notice this is not cerebral, like we were just talking about in the midbrain. This is cerebellar. So this is going to be, these axons here in this tract are going to be heading into the cerebellum which is right behind the ponds. And what this track connects is the motor cortex, the cerebral motor cortex, connects it to the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is actually the most important part of the brain for motor coordination. So we'll talk about that in just a little while. And so this is what the track is connecting. It just happens to pass through the ponds. Also, the ponds has an important respiratory center. This just means that the neurons here will help to control the rate and the rhythm of respiration. Okay, and this is the area that you'll talk about more when you take physiology. This works together with a respiratory center that's in the medulla. This is all you need to know about the ponds for now. Okay, so going down into the next part of the brainstem, which is the medulla, 
And this is actually a cross section through the ponds. You can see it has this big interior bulge here. And these are actually on, kind of sticking out laterally. This is the, where the middle cerebellar peduncle would be. The axons that are traveling in that track pass through the ponds, creating this kind of lateral bulge on either side. And this is part of the fourth ventricle. You can see how the fourth ventricle right here is kind of behind the pons and the medulla. Okay, so now we're going to go down into the medulla. This is an important area for autonomic reflexes, meaning that the medulla is really what just keeps us going on kind of just a reflex level, maintains heart rate, maintains respiration, maintains um, normal blood pressure. So really important area for just keeping us alive. When people have damage to the medulla, it is usually fatal. And that's when they're sometimes put on, you know, um, a respirator, heart, lung machine kind of thing to, to keep them alive until eventually, you know, they're usually taken off at some point. Um, so located here is what is called the cardiovascular center. And you guys know cardio refers to the heart vascular refers to blood vessels okay so this is an area that controls heart rate and I'm just going to abbreviate heart rate okay that is the official abbreviation and blood pressure which is abbreviated BP okay the respiratory center works together with the respiratory center that we just talked about in the pons And together they control the rate and rhythm of respiration. Okay, and then along with those reflexes, other reflexes located here in the medulla would be reflexes controlling swallowing, sneezing, vomiting, coughing, things that empty body cavities when we have an irritation. And this is why sometimes as people have advanced Alzheimer's that will eventually can affect the brainstem, they can't swallow, you know, they can't do things that we just, you know, have you know, just kind of working on a reflex level. Things that, you know, just as we move food back into the pharynx, the swallowing reflex normally takes over. Well, in people who have damage to this area, it doesn't work. Okay, so let's take a look at the medulla, and there's just a couple structures there I would also like you to know. <coughs> and these are called the pyramids and the olives. Okay, so let's take a look at this and I will show them to you. So just so you guys know, this diagram, this phantom view where we're looking through the tissue and you can see kind of all these different um, nuclei that we just talked about, you do not need to worry about that diagram. That will not be on the test. This one might, and you can see some of these structures here that we're gonna talk about now. Notice this is also another view of the fourth ventricle. Okay, so on the anterior medulla, you see these little bulges here, okay? They're not huge, but they kind of stick out a little bit. These are called the pyramids, okay? The pyramids are where projection tracks travel through the medulla. And so they create these little bulges on the anterior side. And then just lateral to the pyramids, we have these little bulges here that are kind of a little more kind of anterolateral called the olives. Sometimes these are even shown on an olive, like in an olive green color on models, which gives you a little clue. And notice that inside, you see this squiggly line. The squiggly line is actually a nucleus. So this is just kind of the pattern that these neurons are organized in, and this is called the inferior olivary nucleus. Neurons in the inferior olivary nucleus carry a specific type of sensory information called proprioception. 
proprioception is body awareness. It's knowing like, you know, how the body is positioned, where the body parts are without having to look. Like for instance, right now, you can feel the position of your feet, right? You know where they are. You don't have to look and try to find them to see, you know, where are my feet? And so that's what proprioception is. And so this is on the neurons here are actually going to be carrying this information back into the cerebellum. Okay, so proprioception to the cerebellum. Proprioception and this is again kind of just an easy way to describe that is its body awareness. We can feel the position of the body because of what we call proprioceptors and these are sensory receptors that are in our joints and our muscles and this feedback constantly goes to the cerebellum so that the cerebellum can help us coordinate movement. Oops, neurons, neurons here. Okay, so the olive is like the little bulge, the little structure that's sticking out, but the nucleus inside the olive is called the inferior olivary nucleus. Okay, so the, the neurons inside make up this nucleus. The pyramids are these more anterior bulges. So this is anterior, this is posterior. The pyramids are here. And then olives are lateral to them. So you can see this on like this model. This is the anterior view. And these structures right here are the pyramids. Lateral to those are the olives. Okay. So notice just like these diagrams, on this model and also on the other brain stem, you see a lot of cranial nerves <coughs> sticking out all over the place. You do not have to identify them all on these models. I will have you guys identify cranial nerves, but it will be on a diagram, and we'll be taking a look at that in just a little while, okay? Do you guys have any questions on that? Mm -hmm. So which one was the one for the motor ones that you said, like those flexions? The red nucleus. Does that ever, like, if someone gets a brain injury and their brain starts swelling and their brain stem starts getting shoved lower than it should be, does that, is that what would be squished, the red area? Because usually when people have a pretty severe brain swelling injury, they'll either flex their arms or they'll extend their arm. Mm. Um, you know, I think that that's a, like, a, probably due to just a, a general, you know, um, uh, something that's going on in a more general way because when the brain swells it's probably going to affect most of the brain the function of most of the brain depending on how severe the swelling is so it, it can certainly affect the red nucleus but the upper motor neurons which are the ones that have their saw bodies in the motor cortex those neurons when they are damaged or when they're not functioning properly like with you know swelling of the brain they cause what's called spastic paralysis and spastic paralysis is um, different from flaccid. Flaccid means that the body parts are kind of limp and just, you know, kind of hanging. Flas uh, spastic means that they're contracted. And so they may be contracted in different ways depending on the muscles that are affected. But it's due to uh, spastic paralysis, it's usually due to some kind of lesion, something that's happening with the upper motor neurons. So say it's you know when someone has brain swelling it's probably going to affect a lot of the brain not just one nucleus but if they have damage to the red nucleus then certainly it would affect their um, motor coordination and I think especially their upper extremities do you guys have any other questions on any of this okay so we are just about done but we just have a a few more areas of the brain to talk about. 
won't take long, and then we'll be done with the brain. Yay! Okay, so the cerebellum. Remember the cerebellum is actually posterior to the brain stem. This is not part of the brain stem itself. It looks kind of like a little miniature cerebrum. Actually, that is what the name means. It means little brain. This is the most important area in the brain for motor <coughs> coordination and balance. Okay, notice these are two things that are really affected by alcohol and other drugs. So when people are given sobriety tests, when they have to do things, you know, like touch their fingertip to their nose or walk, you know, like a straight line or balance with their eyes closed, they're really testing the cerebellum. But as you all know, I mean, I think we've all seen people, if we haven't experienced it ourselves <laughs> at some point, we've all seen people who are uh, under the influence. And we know they have a hard time walking, they have a hard time balancing, their motor coordination is affected. And so when people have damage to the cerebellum, they often look like they are drunk or you know, under the influence. They, they can't um, coordinate their movement and make the movement look normal. Now, can they still contract skeletal muscles and kind of you know, move in a, in a clumsy way? Yes, because the motor cortex, remember, is what sends the signals to the skeletal muscles. But this is a really important area for helping make the movement look normal. And just things that we kind of take for granted, like being able to tap and keep a, a rhythm, people who have damage to this area cannot do that. So it affects movement in pretty profound ways. Okay, so let's take a look at the structure of the cerebellum. Notice that it has these folds, just like the cerebrum. It's just they're smaller. So these are not called gyri, they are called folia like the foliage of a tree, okay? These little tiny pills are called the folia. Okay, and that would increase surface area of the cortex. So just like the cerebrum, there is a cerebellar cortex. This is where most of the neuron cell bodies in the cerebellum would be. You can see that here in this mid-sagittal cut. And notice that you can see the white matter branching out toward the cortex. The white matter, because it looks like a tree, is actually called the arbor vitae, which means tree of life. Okay, arbor vitae. So I would like you to know that name. I would like you to know the white matter of the cerebellum is called the arbor vitae. Okay, arbor vitae. And also notice it has these two hemispheres, just like the cerebrum has two hemispheres. These are divided into lobes. You do not need to know the names of the lobes. This structure connecting them is on your list. This is called the vermis. Vermis means it is worm-shaped, okay? Or it's a worm-like structure, okay? This tissue right here connecting the two hemispheres. You will see this is also on your list for the sheep brain, but when you guys get the sheep brains, they will probably already be cut in half. So that means there's gonna be a cut going right through the vermis. So the, to see that, what you wanna do is take the two halves and put them together, and then you will see the vermis in the center, okay? Okay, so how does the cerebellum work? I think that actually this is really interesting and I would like you guys to know kind of how it does its job of kind of coordinating movement. And actually this is very simple. It really just receives sensory feedback from the body. Like we were saying, it receives that type of sensory feedback called proprioception. So it knows how the body is positioned. So the cerebellum can actually make corrections and it will send corrective feedback to the cerebral cortex while we are still moving, while the movement is actually happening. And so, of course, all that happens really fast. So that's how you can, you know, be bringing your finger to your nose and it actually gets to the nose. Now, we don't see all the corrections happening, right? You don't see this happening, but that's really kind of on a more smooth, you know, faster, you know, basis, that's what's happening. It's making corrections while the movement is still in progress. So let's take a look at that. This actually is in chapter 17, and this diagram will not be on your test. This is more just for understanding how the cerebellum works. So you can read this to understand what's going on here, but I will write this out for you, make it a little bit 
I think, um, or clear. I'll give you my simplified version. So notice that coming into the cerebellum, we have these three tracks. We talked a little bit about this one that goes through the pons. Remember, that one is called the middle cerebellar peduncle. But notice we also have a superior cerebellar peduncle and an inferior cerebellar peduncle. So these are the three, <laughs> three tracks that connect to the cerebellum, and let's talk about how these work. So first of all, notice that this middle cerebellar peduncle that goes through the pons here, it's actually carrying information from the motor cortex of the cerebrum. Okay, so what this is carrying is really like the planned movement. It's telling the cerebellum what we're trying to do. So the middle cerebellar peduncle carries what I call the motor plan to the cerebellum. Okay, this is the planned movement. Telling, what the, telling the cerebellum what we're trying to do. Okay, now the cerebellum receives sensory feedback from the body through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Okay. So this carries that proprioception Okay, body awareness type of feedback to the cerebellum. So this tells the cerebellum how we're actually moving. What is the movement actually like? Now the cerebellum can compare these two and it can make corrections. Okay, and the corrections are carried on the superior peduncle. Hmm. And you can see that information is going to go up to the cortex. Okay, so that is the superior. Okay, so this carries corrective feedback. To the motor cortex. And then the motor cortex, which is, you know, the big boss, can kind of adjust the movement. So this is, you know, just kind of in a simplified way, this is what's happening, but that's, that's pretty much how it works. So I would like you to know this for the written exam. When you look at this model, okay, this guy here, because the cerebellum is removed, you can see these peduncles. So you just kind of have to, you know, imagine when you're looking at these, this is where axons would be traveling into the cerebellum. The cerebellum would sit right here. So this big thing sticking out laterally, okay, you can kind of see how it looks like it's connected to the pons here. This is the middle cerebellar peduncle, okay? It's a big one here. Then the more superior one is the superior, and right below that is the inferior, okay? So when you look at this close up, if you're not sure, I will point those out to you again. Now you can't see them on models like this because the cerebellum is attached. So you can't see the peduncles, they would be kind of down inside there, okay? Okay, so that is the cerebellum. So if you guys want to read about this in chapter 17, um, I mean, I think there may be like a paragraph on it or you can just Take a look at this, along with the diagram, or you can just use this, okay? Which I think I actually have in the PowerPoint. This is in chapter 17, because 17 explains how things are connected. It explains all the pathways. Do you guys have any questions on that? Okay, you guys, so we are just about done with the brain. I know I already said that, but there's just a couple more areas I wanna talk about. And this 
this actually is on this next slide. So let's talk about some structures that work together that are shown in this next diagram. <laughs> Boy, Glenn, do you guys have any other questions on any of that? Okay. So this next diagram, you can see what the title is. It is called the limbic system. And you can see it, it actually is a bunch of areas that are kind of all uh, related functionally, they work together. So these are partly in the cerebrum, okay? So this is all part of the cerebrum, and then part of it is down in the diencephalon. Limbic means border, and if you look at where this is all located, it's kind of on the medial border of the cerebrum, so that's what the name means, okay, is border. <laughs> these structures all work together to give us the experience of different emotions. This is what's sometimes called the emotional brain. So different parts of the limbic system, when they're stimulated, they give people you know, the feelings of you know, joy, pleasure, pain, um, rage, fear. So different parts of it will elicit different emotions. Um, also kind of interesting about this is notice that the olfactory bulb and tract is included. And so this is why sometimes smell, which is really important in other species, but in humans, sometimes we have like an emotional response to certain smells, like maybe the smell of an, you know, an ex-boyfriend or girlfriend's <laughs> cologne, or I don't know, you know, I'm just giving you an example. Something, you know, that smells like your house that you used to live in, or your mom, or whatever. So, but I think a lot of our senses actually elicit emotional responses, you know, things that we, you know, an old song that we liked or whatever. But smell is directly connected with the rest of these structures, so it often will, um, you know, kind of elicit an emotion. Important in other species because, as you guys know, other species, re, you know, really rely a lot on their sense of smell for survival. So the limbic system is also not only, you know, in humans, we think of it to be more involved with just emotion, um, which is important, of course, but in other species, it's really a means of survival. It's important just for their being able to, you know, sense danger um, or food, you know, and um, respond to that. Okay, so I would like you guys to be able to identify parts of the limbic system that are on your study guide, and they are shown in this diagram. So this diagram will be on the test, be on the practical exam. I may ask you to identify some of those parts, like the cingulate gyrus is on the list, the olfactory bulb and tract. This area here, which is called the hippocampus. Something else that's interesting about this part of the brain the hippocampus is the most important part of the brain as far as um, memory is concerned. It's the most important memory area of the brain. <coughs> Notice it's connected to all these other structures in the limbic system. So this is why we actually remember things better if they have more of an emotional impact, which I think we all probably have experienced, right? If you have a real um, kind of emotional connection to something, you tend to remember it. If something kind of um, kind of reaches you on a deeper level, you know, and it's not just intellectual facts. So if you can get really emotional about anatomy, you're gonna remember it better. I don't know how you go about doing that, but. <laughs> and also they say, actually, if you're experiencing a little bit of pain while you're learning, that it can help you to remember. Not again, I don't know how you do that. Um, I used to sit on an exercise bike a lot when I would study, and I think that little bit of discomfort, I'm telling you, I think it had some, I really think I remembered what I was studying better when I was, you know, sitting there on my exercise bike. It's not really painful, hopefully, but it's a little discomfort, I think, when you're working on it. So, I don't know, it, you know, it was my theory. I don't know if it really helped or not. Um, so anyway, that is the limbic system. 
an interesting area of the brain. Um, and this is in chapter 15. Okay, so one more part of the brain I want to talk about a little bit, going back to chapter 17, and that is the reticular activating system. Okay, so this is something else that's in chapter 17 because of these connections that go from this group of nuclei here, shown in red, up to the cortex. Okay, so notice that there's this area that's outlined in red. This is what is called the reticular formation. And this is really a group of nuclei that's throughout the brain stem. So when you look at these different parts of the brain stem, the reason why they're showing you this cut through the midbrain is so you can see the reticular formation here. I'm not gonna ask you to identify this, okay? But you should know about this for the written exam. So we have this group of nuclei scattered throughout the brain stem. And you can see how, notice how there are these connections, axons, that go from the reticular formation to the cortex, right? We have cortex up here. And you guys know the cortex has all these different areas that are always receiving sensory information. We, you know, kind of take in all that sensory information, think about it, and then we have some kind of a response. Well, because this area here, the reticular formation, sends signals to the cortex, what it's really doing is it's kind of activating the cortex. So it is called the reticular activating system. When these neurons are sending more signals, the cortex becomes more active and we feel more awake and alert. So this area is really responsible for literally activating the cortex. It's responsible for different levels of alertness. When this area is more quiet, we feel more sleepy. If the reticular formation is damaged, it will result in coma or unconsciousness, okay? So the reticular formation is the group of nuclei Okay, and these ascending, you know, axons that go up to the cortex are called the reticular activating system. So how do we make this area more active when you want to feel more awake? Well, notice that the reticular formation receives sensory feedback from the entire body, but especially from the face. So that's why when you wake up in the morning, if you like splash cold water on your face or you listen to you know, TV or radio, you get some auditory input, um, you turn on the lights, all of that you know, sensory input will tend to make you feel more awake because it will activate these neurons, which in turn activate the cortex, the cortex, you know, the different parts of the cortex start talking to each other, so you feel more alert. When the room is dark and we're getting less input from, you know, light, you start, start feeling more sleepy usually, and so it's because the reticular formation is not as active. Uh-huh, Kelly? So how are those things different than the neural radii then? Like, is there also does that the cortex oh does this uh, does this uh, become involved or is it included like it in the corona radiata how is it different if the nerves are going through the cortex you know that's a good question and i am not sure if this would become part of the corona radiata or uh, exactly what path these would take going up into. I think it probably would be. I think these neurons would be part of, I think these axons would be part of the corona radiata. The corona radiata is just all of those axons in you know, the area that like between the deep nuclei and the cerebrum and the cortex. So everything that has to go up to the cortex, all of those axons become part of it. And so I think these axons would become part of it, along with, you know, like sensory, uh, axons carrying sensory information from the body. Um, the axons are going from the thalamus, 
carrying sensory information, you know, up to the the cortex, all of that would become part of it. Okay, so these axons traveling from, and I'm just going to abbreviate reticular formation here, okay, to the cortex. And these are responsible for levels of alertness. Okay, you guys, I think that is it. And that's all there is to it. That's the brain. <laughs> it's just that easy. <laughs> okay. So, um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about cranial nerves some with you guys because although they are in your book, I would like to kind of um, tell you what I would like you to know about them. So what we'll do is why don't we, we'll take a break and I'm trying to think what, how we'll do this. I think what we'll do is um, instead of covering that next, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the spinal cord so we can start with the spinal cord. And then when you guys are doing lab stuff, I'm just gonna write this on the board and you can write it down or take a picture or whatever, okay? Okay, so let's take a break. Let's come back at, um, let's look at 8.50, okay, 8.50. We'll talk about the spinal cord.